but uh, we have a lot of content to share with you this morning, so I want to make sure we have enough time to get through everything. Uh, my name is Sandy Kaiser. I am one of the Employment First Specialists uh, for the State of Missouri. Uh, Stephen Taylor, who is the other Employment First Specialist, is having a little bit of technical difficulty uh, joining us, so uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that he is still able to join us, but uh, we may not be able to hear much from him today. So anyway, um, while I'm talking, I'm going to invite each of you to kind of just pop in the chat your role. So are you a service provider? Are you a support coordinator? Uh, are you some other state agency uh, staff? Um, or are you, uh, you know, a, a regional office employee or uh, an individual family member? So just pop that in so that we can kind of have an idea of the makeup of our audience this morning. So um, Champions of Employment, give you a little background with this, uh, the formation of this idea. So I had started a group in the St. Louis area. We had a support coordinator identified from each of the St. Louis regional office teams. And each month I would get together with those support coordinators, just providing some mentoring, talking about employment, sharing resources in the hopes that we would help them feel a little bit more comfortable about employment and they could share that with their team. So then uh, we wanted to see about how can we make this go statewide? How can we take the, the employment champions concept, the mentoring support coordinators in the St. Louis area, and how could we make it work? statewide where we can have more impact on support coordinators throughout the state of Missouri, especially since we're down to just two employment first specialists, even in myself. So that's where we came up with the champions of employment. Uh, many of you are probably also very familiar with our employment first Missouri community of practice webinars uh, being hosted each month around a certain topic. So we want to kind of use a similar concept of having a planned topic, having an engaging conversation with support coordinators. So that's the whole concept of the Champions of Employment. This is brand new. We want to make sure that this is worthwhile of your time, that you are getting value out of it. So your feedback is going to be very important to us in making sure that we make this event what everybody wants it to be. So now today's topic, we want we wanted to bring you some perspectives. So three different perspectives. We wanted to bring you the perspectives of service providers. How has the pandemic affected how services are being provided to individuals through the eyes of the service providers? We also wanted to bring that individual perspective. How is it for individuals with disabilities who are working during this pandemic or seeking employment during this pandemic? What's it been like for them? And finally, to wrap it up, we wanted to bring that, that job market, that workforce uh, perspective. So we have Yvonne Wright from Workforce or Department of Higher Education, Workforce Development, who will bring that how has this pandemic affected the job market? How has it affected what jobs are available and how people search for jobs? So um, again, we have a lot of information kind of crammed into our, our 60 minutes. So we've got poll questions and chat box chatter questions designed to really get some participation from our attendees. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. So we're going to start off with one of those questions. Uh, so first poll question, we want to know, have you seen a change in individuals' interest in pursuing and retaining employment? Your options are yes, no, or hard to tell. So start answering that. You've got about a minute, and then we'll let you know what the results were.
All right. So we had about 21 out of 58 people mention that they have seen a change. So the majority of you guys have seen a, a change in uh, interest. Uh, the next one that was um, second was hard to tell. So some of you are kind of like, maybe, maybe not, can't really tell. It's, it's um, I'm sure about that. So, all right, about eight of you said no, and then there were 16 that weren't able to respond yet. So, we're going to go on to our second poll question. So, we want to know, why do you think there has been a change in interest in employment? Uh, is it due to people staying home? So, uh, the, those COVID precautions, people just aren't going out. Uh, is it because people don't really have that ability to have that meaningful conversation? We're, we're not really truly able to gauge the interest through a virtual meeting. So maybe a, a disconnect there. Uh, maybe it's because people are feeling like the, the supports they need are not available. Either there's not a provider available or the provider is only doing virtual support. Uh, so you know, the person kind of feels like, I don't have the support that I would need. And then the last option would be uh, that there's a lack of jobs matching the interests and abilities. Uh, and of course, we've got the question, is there an option for all of the above? And unfortunately, no, uh, we don't. But feel free to put that in the chat box if you feel like that would be more appropriate. So. Uh, Go ahead, you guys got right about about a minute to answer the question, so. Okay, and it looks like our poll ended. Uh, very quickly there. I don't know if we had the full minute or what happened there. Uh, so, uh, of the uh, few that were able to respond, it looks like we had about uh, maybe about 30 people who were able to respond there. Uh, we had fear of COVID, so uh, staying at home, that was the most popular uh, answer. Next in line was unable to get that support. Um, so uh, people that felt like maybe there weren't any providers available or the providers were only able to do virtual supports and they needed more in-person support. Uh, we only had a few people saying that lack of jobs matching interests and abilities or inability to have that meaningful conversation to truly gauge that interest. Uh, those were the, the next. So, without further ado then, I wanna get into getting to our provider experiences. So first we're going to have Rachel Worcester who is the Director of Community Employment from Job One in the Kansas City area. She's going to talk about how the pandemic has affected Job One services to individuals uh, during this time. So Rachel, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you to talk. Perfect, thank you, Sandy. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, what a crazy year it's been. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's been feeling that way. Um, so, you know, through this uh, COVID pandemic, there's been some things that have changed, some that haven't. Um, we um, just, we have a lot more safety protocols in place and there's been a lot of different um, places where we are following safety protocols. So um, in our office, we've started to have health screening questionnaire for our clients and staff um, just to make sure um, that everybody is, health, is as healthy as can be uh, to try and limit exposure. And um, just following the different guidelines from CDC, Health Department, um, and different employer policies, we've been trying to keep up um, with all of our um, individuals that are in the community working and just make sure that we are educated on that end as well uh, to help them be able to succeed and stay healthy. 
Um, and then um, with scheduling, you know, that's been another thing that's just changed. Um, we've had to get a lot more flexible with scheduling. Um, in our office, we've gotten to an A and B schedule, um, another way to try and limit exposure. Um, so our staff has had to adapt to working from home sometimes, but they're still going into the community, still meeting with clients. Um, everything is still very individualized. So whether or not the client um, is comfortable going out in the community or uh, wants to schedule um, meetings over an online platform like Zoom or Teams, um, we just are trying, we just keep trying to be as flexible as we can and provide as many options as we can um, so that we can provide as meaningful services as possible. And we are so, so thankful for technology. I think um, everyone has grown in the use of technology, staff and individuals. Um, and if that's been a learning curve, but I think I've seen a lot of progress with that as well, um, which is having different options available and making the use out of um, what resources uh, we have as well as the individuals that we serve. Um, and we always try and be creative. Um, we've had to get even more creative in the way that we are providing services. Again, just to keep it individualized, um, we've done virtual home visits, which I think has gone really well. Um, the one thing that's been nice with um, being able to do some virtual platforms is having um, being able to talk to some support staff that might be hard to get a hold of, um, and that just gives us easier access. So that has been uh, phenomenal as well. Um, and um, from, so we had about 78% of our individuals that were working um, when mid-March, when the, um, when everything shut down, uh, we had um, that 78% were either uh, laid off, they quit or um, lost their job. But um, I'm glad to say that of that 78%, 57% are back to work. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot of progress in individuals continuing to find employment, whether they got their jobs back or they were able to find something new. Um, so we were really happy to see uh, that increase. And um, a lot of the clients that we have right now that are not working or seeking employment are just because they cannot go out in the community um, for various uh, reasons. Um, and there hasn't been much change in uh, GMH funding. Um, but we are appreciative of the increase in flexibility in providing those services. DMH did a phenomenal job um, getting the information out as soon as everything um, was switching to virtual and giving us the opportunity to do that so we can still have meaningful conversations with our individuals, continue to get to know them in a safe way. Um, so that's been great. Um, and then compared to VR, um, nothing's really changed with VR besides we do have some milestones that do have increased amounts relating to our initial plans and um, our placements. And they did increase a little bit for job coaching too, acknowledging the challenges that we were having um, in helping individuals find employment um, and that we were still, you know, we um, have always continued to be in the community providing services. Um, and I think the the biggest thing um, in just trying to stay prepared and on top of things um, during this pandemic and following the you know the constant changes in um, different policies and procedures mandates um, is just to maintain the health and safety of our clients and staff. Everything has been super intentional um, to make sure that um, everybody is taken care of and try and limit as much exposure as we can. Um, and continuing to keep everything individualized and just continuing to stay flexible and creative um, with those services. Um, and it's been a priority of just making sure that um, our uh, individuals that we work with that are essential workers, that they just get the supports they need, whether it be on the job, off the job, um, extra trainings on health and safety, and just make sure that they have the knowledge that they need to keep working and keep going strong. Um, and stay as healthy as possible. Um, and I think just the uncertainty has been a big fear of ours. Um, just with everything changing, we just continue to pivot, do the best we can, um, work as a team. And um, it's, we've seen a lot of increases. I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of team effort I've seen um, continue between um, my staff and then the individuals we serve and their support teams. Um, communication has been great. Um, trying everybody just getting together, having sessions to talk everything out. 
and make sure that um, our individuals have the support. So, you know, we had a house manager who worked with IT to make sure that the individual had the technology, so we're able to meet with them, do a virtual home visit, um, and so that's been great. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the biggest things is that I've gotten from this is just the use of technology. Um, the fact that we can just individualize things even more. We've seen that some of our clients um, have actually done better on Zoom because they almost have that transition of getting to know us um, without having to go somewhere and meet us. And um, so I think that's something that I would kind of like to see continue, um, you know, on an individualized basis um, to just provide that support. Um, get to know some people and then ease into that transition of meeting in person to provide those services. So I think um, we have had some positive things come out of this as well. That's kind of awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. Now, I did not see any questions pop up in the chat box. Uh, so for those attending, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. Uh, for time, we may move on to the next speaker. So if uh, the current speaker that you're asking the question of doesn't have time to respond to your questions, we will make sure that we get those answers and we will post them on our website with the materials from this webinar. So thank you, Rachel. So I, I want to move on to our next guest speaker, who is Nicholas Andrew Alexander. He is also a manager of employment services from the Kansas City area. He comes from Easter Seals Midwest. So Nicholas, uh, briefly, how have things changed for your organization during the pandemic? What what did, things did you see happen? Yeah, um, so like Rachel said, the safety protocols is the most obvious thing. Um, we took about two weeks off where we stopped in-person services. But I am happy to say that we never stopped services completely. Um, when we did those two weeks off, we did a lot of virtual stuff with individuals so we could keep working with them. Um, but during those two weeks, we developed our protocol. Uh, we bought thermometers and we did everything we could to um, make a plan to come back safely. That plan is obviously involved. Um, so we started with just health checks um, and deep cleaning of the office, uh, daily cleaning, all that kind of stuff. Um, since then, we've developed, we've developed our scheduling so that there's no overlap between um, what staff works with what individual. Because um, we were, we got worried about like there'd be a chain reaction where uh, one staff gives it to an individual, gives it to another staff, and then spreads to their entire caseload. Um, so it just had to be really particular about how we plan um, to make sure there is no overlap and keep everybody safe. Um, you know, we've all, we have seen a reduce um, reduction in our DMH referrals, um, just with everything going on with the wait list and COVID. And there's just we I have people who I know are interested in services. But this, the funding hasn't been there. Um, and then as far as like our employed numbers go, um, I feel we've done really well. About 25% of the individuals that we've been supporting um, in our employment and pre-employment um, got placed. So we got 25 placements in the last nine months, um, which is actually it's about where we would expect to be um, if there wasn't a pandemic. And that's including that we have uh, about 10% of our individuals that are just refusing to job search because they're scared of everything that's going on. They don't think it's safe. They don't think that there's a good fit. Um, so we've had, so we've been very successful with getting our placements. Um, a lot of our individuals were able to continue working through the pandemic with very little pause, um, about 15 of them. And then 12 uh, individuals did have their hours cut or were laid off, um, but most of them are back to work now, um, or at least exploring job options. So what procedures or practices would you like to see continue past this pandemic? Um, so the biggest thing I saw, like Rachel said, was the um, use of technology because so, for example, in Easter Seals, we have a pre-employment program that involves classroom time. So when this all started, one of the things that we implemented was doing those classroom times over Zoom. And it was so effective. Maybe not, you know, quite as effective as in person, and we didn't get the volunteer experience that came along with it. But if there were communities that are currently unable to be served by those, like, group programs, 
that I think that's a very viable option where you have one individual from Boonville and one individual from Sweet Springs all joining in on the Zoom call to learn those skills. Uh, and then it's also just really stressed the importance of flexibility with our programs, with our um, funders, everything like that, because when everything first happened, we saw, you know, a decrease in our day program numbers because obviously we didn't want to have a ton of people gathering in our building, but we were able to make up for that by um, diverting to our other different uh, programs. We had autism specialists doing individual skill development for us here uh, in Kansas City. Um, we had people from our day program going up to St. Joe's to uh, do community living. We had our pre-employment staff filling in for summer work. Um, so because we were able to remain so flexible as an agency, it allowed us to keep our staff doing well, our um, individuals making progress, um, and everything run, ran fairly smoothly. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So again, I am not seeing any questions in the chat box for you, but I will note that Dwayne Shoemate is providing some updates about our Empowering Through Employment authorization. Uh, that typic or basically what we've seen throughout 2020 is that our authorizations have remained stable. We had about 1,039 individuals receiving employment services in March. Uh, and as of the current month, we, we have 1,034 people with an authorization. So not much change there. He also notes that there have actually been increases in Albany, Kirksville, Poplar Bluff, and Sykeston. So, which leads me to our next guest speaker. Eric Anderson is the Director of Employment Services for Trendline Consulting, which is out of our Cape Girardeau uh, area. So, trying to give a, a, a little different perspective, we had two providers from the Kansas City area and now uh, a less metropolitan, more rural, not completely rural, but more rural area uh, than the Kansas City area. So, Eric, I'm going to let you take it and talk about what you see. I appreciate it um, for this opportunity. Also, uh, Yvonne Wright and Dwayne Shoemate are kind of former mentors of mine at different periods, and uh, I look up to very much. So, this is a great opportunity for me. Um, so, as Tony mentioned, uh, we do serve the Cape Girardeau area. Our primary counties are Perry County and St. Jen County, which are north of that and very rural. We are also only a DMH uh, waiver provider, so that may be unique to uh, some providers that are on this call. Um, so, when COVID happened with us, we did have a couple individuals uh, lose employment, but one of the things that uh, Dwayne taught me as a former, when he was my supervisor, was that you know, these don't look at these things as negative ways, don't look at them as mistakes. These are opportunities. And that's how we chose to look at this. We used a choice with uh, staff and consumers with their comfort level as far as whether they wanted to meet in person or virtually. Um, also, whether they were comfortable going to work or not, as well as like our job coaches, are they comfortable going? Um, so we used informed choice on every level. Um, and while we did have some consumers lose jobs, we had other consumers gain jobs. Um, due to COVID in our areas, uh, the rural areas, including the city of Cape Girardeau, uh, it seemed like openings actually increased. We had quite a bit of job openings in the area, and it may have been a result of COVID or not. But you know, just like we were deciding whether we wanted to go to work or not, we were allowing the consumers to make that same choice. Um, of course, we used all social distancing, uh, masks, all of that. Um, and for the providers out there, uh, we did go, we did get the PPP funding, so we did have a little safety net there. Um, our services decreased exponentially uh, when it hit. We went to a lot of virtual sessions, but being in a rural area, some of our consumers didn't have internet access. Some of them um, had really uh, significant transportation issues or just weren't comfortable meeting in person. Um, so we had to get pretty creative with it, and the virtual sessions really uh, helped us uh, stay afloat, and it allowed us to operate a lot more creatively. So I know DMH is looking at whether to make that a, a more long-term uh, opportunity or not for providers, but I know it really helped uh, support the consumers we serve, especially in a rural area. Um, when we took advantage of the PPP loan, um, as a provider, having such a significant decrease in services and paying everyone, we also saw that as an opportunity. 
we created teams to work on different projects to make our provider better and to allow us all to be more competent. So uh, we looked into and started the process of becoming an employment network. We started to get into compliance with CARF accreditation. Um, we had multiple teams working on um, curriculum for pre-vocational um, services. We now have two certified benefits planners, myself included. Uh, it, it, my biggest gripe for COVID is that I had to do that. That manual is huge. Um, we worked on assessment projects, but we try to get really creative in if we can't serve consumers directly, how can we still get better as a provider, operate with integrity with taxpayer money utilizing PPP, and uh, come out on the other end uh, better than we were before. Um, as things have started to stabilize, um, all of our consumers have gone to work, and actually uh, we have more consumers employed now than we did prior to COVID. One of the things that really helped and and fundings on this list is where our county stepped up. And I think we have someone on the phone call to definitely help me out at any point, but uh, Pamela Danicki, she's a unique uh, individual in a unique position working for uh, SB, uh, I guess I targeted case management agency here. And I believe we probably increased referrals as well. Our sheltered workshop, and again, we're just a DMH provider, but our sheltered workshop lost a lot of contracts. They lost work as well. So uh, Pam Denicky really helped the support coordinators understand this is actually an opportunity for those individuals in the workshop to explore stuff they've never thought of before, they've never explored. So our support coordinators were great in um, talking to the consumers and giving them that opportunity. So we have a lot of individuals now currently going through that discovery process. If they choose to return to the workshop, that's great, but we have a lot that are expressing interest in doing more, and that's very exciting. Um, some other really cool things is that um, I'm going to give one consumer example. Uh, I try to get this consumer on, but she's 19 and very shy. Uh, she used some choice words with me that I probably can't uh, say for even uh, suggesting it. But this is a really cool example where Pam Denicky uh, with our uh, targeted case management agency helped us with this as well. But uh, I know the state, uh, Yvonne Wright, Duane, like everybody's involved in braiding services. I've heard a lot about braiding services. And we were actually able to do this with a WIOA youth program where they provided some of the funding for a business and we were able to provide the supports. Uh, this individual worked at a hospital and when COVID hit, she immediately lost her job. They went to essential employees, cut to a skeleton staff, and we were able to help her find another job um, working at the local high school. And uh, that's something that might become more long-term she now has a really good uh, resume with uh, two different things on it, but we worked really closely with WIOA um, and our support coordinators to really make sure this individual had ongoing support even through COVID. And it was just a really cool collaboration. Um, so that's the first time I've seen it work uh, within different uh, agencies, but it was that braiding of services for those consumers was a very cool experience. Um, and the only other thing, knowing that we had kind of have different audiences on this phone call, is like for the support coordinators, in our communities, the three counties we serve, this has actually been an opportunity that a lot of our consumers, I don't think, ever realized. With the um, sheltered workshops kind of shutting down or slowing down, um, we've had more referrals in all three of those counties. And just those conversations that don't always take place or have before, it's really exciting. It's it's really fun to talk to those consumers who will, you know, I'm sure they've been exposed, but when they're in our office, they act like they've never, uh, you know, no one's ever asked them these questions before. And it's really, really exciting. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say for um, what we hope to do as an agency uh, going forward, what we've learned from this is uh, we're starting to move forward in CARF accreditation. I know the other two um, providers are already a part of that, but that's definitely uh, made us better. And we use this experience to explore those options. Um, we now have new internal policies. We have better trained staff. Um, we have better relationships with our support coordinators and the consumers than we've ever had having to be creative and uh, spending more time with them on the phone than we ever have. Uh, you know, normally on the phone, we just kind of set up appointments and say, all right, you know, when are we going to meet in person? And we would always come with such kind of a structured curriculum or an idea of what we hope to do. But over the phone, it's, hey, what's going on? And it's allowed us to take a much more holistic approach and listen to them 
beyond our agenda. And I like to say we do that anyway, but not near to the extent that we've been able to do it with this. Um, so I feel like we're better as a result because of the resources that we have in our communities. Um, also, uh, DMH kind of loosening the guidelines to allow providers to be more creative. Um, and then also, uh, if Pam's on the call, like our, our, our I guess, uh, provide, I, our targeted case managers down here are great. And um, the better we work with them, the more we've been able to get through this in a way that's benefited everybody. So it's definitely been hard at times. We've, we've definitely lost money, but uh, using the resources we have available, uh, I think we're coming out better than we were before. All right, thank you so much, Eric. I know Dwayne had popped in a question for support coordinators uh, asking if there were stories where they have worked closely with employment service providers to build confidence and safe opportunities for continuing individuals' career pathways. So uh, support coordinators, something for you to think about. So, uh, I think Stephen has joined us now, so I'm going to allow Stephen to kind of take the rein here for a moment. So, Stephen. Sorry, I was late getting on. I had some technical difficulties. Uh, so, the next uh, question for the chatterbox is, was there anything that surprised you about the service provider's experiences? So, I guess I will wait to, for responses. Yeah, we'll give it about a minute. Okay. Like one thing while we're waiting on that. Um, one of the things that like I kind of talked about, like the importance of the flexibility, but we did not have a plan for anything like this um, before until March. Uh, but now I think moving forward, if we ever have a catastrophic change, whether it's pandemic, natural disaster, anything, we can we have a playbook almost so that's really nice to know it's kind of a relief that i didn't even know i was stressed about, like about something i didn't even know i was stressed about yeah i think we're we're definitely ready should we experience another event like this again so i am not seeing anything pop up in the chat box um so we're going to move on here. So we've got uh, two individuals willing to share their personal experiences. So Ashley is from um, the western side of the state. She was seeking a job and got a job uh, during this pandemic. So I'm going to start with Ashley. So Ashley, what was it like uh, searching for a job during this pandemic? Did you have to do anything different? I, I did Zoom calls with my job recruiter. Okay, so instead of meeting in person, you were doing virtual uh, Zoom calls with your, your job recruiter. Okay. Yes. Anything else you had to do differently? Uh, no, not that I can remember. Okay. So then you also got a job during this time. So what has that been like? Uh, crazy. <laughs> so crazy, how has it been crazy? Everybody has to wear their mask while working and we have to stay six feet away from everybody. Okay. So kind of like the social distancing, the, the wearing the mask. So. Um, what about your job support? What's your job uh, support been like? Good, I guess. Have you been receiving in-person job coaching or has it been more virtual using, you know, your phone and camera? Um, I guess virtual, but nobody ever really checks up on me on how I'm doing. Okay. Maybe. So, Beckles, I knew you were familiar with, with Ashley. You have something you wanted to add there? Yeah, so um, Ashley definitely did not receive the in-person support she normally would have. 
um, because the location she's uh, was placed at was not accepting job coaches right now. So everything has been, been virtual. Um, luckily, she's you know a great hard worker, and it hasn't been a problem for her. But would it could have been a problem for other individuals? Great. So, Ashley, um, what have your biggest fears been during this time? I do not have no biggest fears. All right. What about those of your your family members? Have have your family members been afraid of you working during this pandemic? Uh, no. Okay. Well, thank you, Ashley. We appreciate your willingness to share your experience. The next person I want to introduce is Austin. Uh, now, a little different from Ashley, Austin was looking for employment, so he hasn't found it yet. He was participating in what we call um, that that career planning, that discovery process, exploration, trying to to find out what would be a good fit for him. Uh, so Austin, I'm going to kind of turn things over to you and what's it been like doing those discovery activities during this pandemic? It's been, um, slow one and, uh, we had to go to a portugal. Did I understand you had to go to virtual? So where yeah. you were contacting uh, businesses using Zoom or, or phone and just talking to them versus being able to see the business in person? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what... Do you feel like you've been able to to get as good of a feel and, and good information doing things virtually as you would have if you had done it in person? Yeah. Okay. So still kind of a success. You were able to, to find out some information, maybe get some good tips uh, that helped you with trying to identify that good job. What? What have your fears been during this time? Um, getting COVID and dying, basically. Oh, definitely. I think we all have that fear. <laughs> Don't want to uh, get sick. So, um, have your family family members had fears about you participating in job searching activities during uh, this pandemic? No, because. They walked on the post this pandemic. Okay. Well, they've been working, so they kind of know as, as long as you're keeping a mask on, keeping a safe distance, and, and following safe procedures, you, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. So what about the support you've been receiving? Um, go ahead. Um. I lost my watch. <laughs> I um it, she was helpful. <laughs> so I know uh Rianne is there with you and, and she's been your employment specialist. So Rianne, do you have something you wanna add there? Yeah, so really just kinda of like everybody else, it's just been a lot of adapting, I would say. Austin's been a trooper. Um, I'm glad. I know at first we started and we were able to go to some healthcare facilities, which is something that he was really interested in. And so right before the pandemic, um, we were able to be in person and get hands on. And then shortly after, a lot of those places closed. And even now, um, we're not sure when we can get back in there. And so it's been awesome how well we've been able to be thankful for technology and different things so we can still have a close experience to that and still make those connections even when we can't be there. Um, and as I just, we've, we're glad to be here in person today, but a lot of it's just been a lot of adapting and figuring out what works so we can find the best fit for Austin as he continues to look for employment during this time. Awesome. So, 
So Austin and uh, Ashley, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing your personal experiences about what it's been like during this pandemic. Uh, we do have a couple questions that uh, attendees have kind of posed in the chat box. Uh, one of my things not everybody has been able to see. Um, so we have a service provider that has regional hubs across the state. Um, and basically, uh, this provider has asked if folks have tried virtual job coaching and, and how is that working? So uh, if you guys have any input on that, please put that into the chat. The other question that I think everybody has been able to, to see uh, is uh, we have somebody asking about tips that people looking for jobs uh, may find the, the virtual process uncomfortable. So how to help uh, people become a little bit more comfortable with that virtual process. So, uh, and then we're going to move on. We've, got, we've also got a chat box, chat a question. So Stephen, go ahead and take it. All right. Uh, have you heard any similar experiences from those on your caseload? So if you'll just um, answer that, and we'll get back when we get to the replies. All right, please. So, all right. So please take a moment to kind of put some thoughts into the, the chat box. Uh, for time's sake, we are going to kind of keep moving along. So our next presenter is Yvonne Wright. She's the Deputy Director, Senior Manager of Policy and Partnerships with Missouri's Department of Higher Education Workforce Development. So uh, Yvonne, take it away. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Sandy, for organizing this. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be working with you over the last few weeks to get this uh, organized, and I hope I can provide some great information for you today. Um, probably a lot of you who I have uh, been around in the past, Stephen, you're a big blast from my past as well, but, <laughs> you know, before I came over to workforce development, I was with vocational rehabilitation for uh, just shy of 25 years, so um, this is like a little bit like coming home for me a little bit, and it's it's, it's always fun and exciting when I can uh, dip back into my uh, my old network of folks. Although we're all in this together, and uh, I, I want to start and first of all say congratulations to Ashley. Congratulations, Ashley. That's just awesome. Uh, and Austin, good luck and continue at it. Don't give up you will find work even in these trying times. So I just wanted to say, I uh, always love hearing how um, folks are doing with their job search and the successes that we all experience um, and get to experience by, by serving um, our customers. So what I'm gonna do is, and you see that the question's on the slide, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom out pretty big for, at first and talk a little bit about the job market. And I'm gonna talk about it from a national level because the statistics that I'm going to be sharing, actually they're both national, it's a national perspective, but it's also Missouri, a look at Missouri as well, but what is happening nationally is also happening in Missouri, so uh, it will pertain. And then I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to talk a little bit about what is going on in Missouri uh, and what we have done uh, and what we see over at Workforce Development as far as job search activities that are changing. And I'm not going to over do the data for you. I am not a data person myself. Um, I, I, it's interesting, but I, I don't get deep, deep into it, but I do want to share a few things with you as far as occupational data. And I don't think what I'm going to share with you is really going to come as a surprise to anybody because of, obviously, of COVID. But over the last year, um, occupations that have increased from uh, in November 2020, so last November compared to the year before that, the occupations that have seen the most increase have been in labor and material movers and truck drivers. So that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I have been home, I don't know, quite a bit. I'm, I'm working now part-time in my office, and I've done a lot of shopping online, a lot, more than I should have. and. Uh, 
there's a need for those material handlers and those laborers and those truck drivers to deliver uh, those goods um, because we changed the way that we um, shop and the way that we uh, get our goods and our services. Even remembering the toilet paper, you know, um, crisis where we, you know, uh, all kind of went crazy. The, we, to ship those supplies back, there has to be, you know, a way for those uh, things to move. And interestingly enough, where we've seen a decrease in the same time period, last November versus the year before that, has been with software developers and in computer occupations. And I'm going to come back to that when I talk about Missouri just a little bit. Where we have, as far as uh, industry, bigger industry, where we've seen an increase, same time period, where we've seen an increase, is in services to buildings and dwellings. One thing that hasn't really decreased is the housing market. We may start seeing that occur, um, but we haven't really seen a decrease in that area, so there's a high need for services to buildings and dwellings um, to take care of those dwellings. And this will come as an, a surprise to no one, that um, the second highest is in health and professional and personal care services. So obviously we're seeing a, a rise in those kinds of occupations. And then uh, before I get to Missouri, I want to just continue to say zoom back out and share with you just three things that um, this is actually out of a national article, but it's stuff that we discuss quite frequently here at the Office of Workforce Development with our job centers and the customers that come in. And I wanted to share with you three big trends that have occurred um, within, um, with, in regard to the job market. Uh, one of them is that um, we have, that as far as the economy actually changing and where it is sitting at this point, is we have found that people have left the workforce altogether and have not come back and they're just not coming back. So I'll talk to Dwayne and me for a minute. Dwayne and I are, are I'm actually at retirement age, uh, excuse me, retirement years, and Dwayne is, is very, very close to that. Um, so we could retire. So there are people who were eligible for retirement last year who instead of, um, you know, maybe they had to go home and work for a little while, they just chose not to come back. So um, we are seeing, though, that um, working age people even, as part of the labor force, have just chosen not to come back yet, which is just very interesting, I think. I, that just is, is incredibly interesting to me. The number of people who have been out of work long term continues to rise, and that should be of no shock to anyone. We, we know that unemployment benefits were uh, recently extended and um, increased for quite a while in 2020, and uh, that is because uh, people are still staying um, out of work for a longer period of time. And then finally, the other interesting thing that has happened to our economy is that unemployment has fallen from the worst. Unemployment has decreased, okay? But the gaps among demographic groups have widened, and they specifically talk about black, Hispanic, Asian, and white uh, white workers by gender, and I've seen articles recently where women are more impacted, but let's throw individuals with disabilities into that group. Um, it does not mention that as part of the demographic, but um, I can assure you, and we know that there are demographics and data out there that does show that, um, that there are widening gaps um, with those demographic groups, those individuals, those groups that are uh, staying unemployed longer. So I wanted to just give you that kind of wide angle lens of, of what is going on across the nation. But let me talk to you very quickly about what's going on in Missouri. Like everybody else, we have experienced um, the impact of COVID. And, and actually, early on, uh, mid-March, the end of March of last year, we uh, actually ended up closing our job centers for uh, several months, and we have slowly, about summer, we started reopening those job centers to the public. And then actually, this fall again, we went to a by appointment only situation for our job centers. So if someone comes to a job center and wants services, they can certainly call on the phone, but they would um, see a sign on the door that says, um, we're meeting by appointment only. 
We've extended that appointment only period through mid-February, and we review and evaluate that all the time. My boss, Dr. Leathers, we have discussions about um, when, you know, when is a good time to go ahead and um, open the centers back up for public to flow in, but we have the same situations that everybody else is having. We deal with, I would say, I don't, I, I'm not, I would say a great percentage of the individuals that we serve through our job centers, because we've never stopped serving customers all during COVID. Even if it had to switch to phone calls, we never stopped. And I would say that we have served a majority of those customers are people who are um, getting unemployment insurance. Our partners over at the Division of Employment Security, it's just too much of a big load when you got all those folks out of work and they're wanting to uh, they're wanting to file a claim. So we have been assisting our partners over at uh, Employment Security for some time now and helping people file for unemployment claims. We're still doing that. It's not quite as much as it was before, but we're still doing that. And believe it or not, I talked about the computer uh, world, the, those job uh, postings are going down. But you know what? What's really interesting is that we were able to get some CARES Act funding because of COVID and we were able to get a grant to focus on uh, COVID, and those grants and that funding went directly for training opportunities, free training opportunities for eligible individuals for our job centers. And I'm just gonna share with you, we are having a hard time in selling training to folks. We have folks that um, actually, they probably mirror some of their your poll questions. They're afraid uh, now, our trainings are online, so they can be done, you know, in the home. But then you have issues with technology. Uh, we've got people who, frankly, are still afraid to get out and go to work. So even if they completed training, they're not really interested in working at this time. But we've had a heck of a time selling training opportunities right now, even though they're free <laughs> to folks that are accessing the service. So I just wanted to share that with you, that we, we it's a daily conversation. And, and we have changed a lot of ways that we approach that. And finally, because I know I've used a lot of my time up, we have to get creative. We have to do things differently. And so uh, to the last question of how job search activities have changed since March, um, we've never stopped serving customers, but what we're doing is we're doing things a little differently. I bet that in the St. Louis area, in fact, I know that this has occurred. There are things like drive-through job fairs, drive-out job fairs, where you know, we, we have the social distancing and people can drive up in their vehicle, submit an application, sometimes even interview for social, from a social distance. So we're learning new ways to deal with things in COVID. And then another piece has been that we have offered virtual job fairs. In fact, we did several in the latter part of 2020 and we're doing some more in 2021. Um, so that it's all virtual so that employers and job seekers can meet up virtually. And we've done general ones and we've actually targeted some like in healthcare. So every day I hear of new ways that folks are trying to uh, work together and serve the customers in a new and different way. And that's not only the job seekers, but the employers. And with that, I think I'll stop. I know I've more than used up my time. Um, if you do have any questions, let me know. If you're interested in more data, I can always get it for you. And thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, I will tell you, we just got a question in the chat box, so I'm going to throw this at you to maybe put a response. We can definitely post it on our website. Uh, the question is, how do we get the information on the free trainings, and are they for persons with limited computer skills? So, Helen, thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, it's part of the reason that I made sure I shared it in case there were interested folks. Why don't you email me, and I'm going to very quickly uh, type my email address in the chat. Why don't you just email me, and I will make sure that you get um, the information that you need. The easiest way to get you the information would be to also connect you with the, the local job center that would be providing the training so that if, if you or someone you're working with is uh, interested in training, I want to be able to make that quick connection for you. Um, uh, and are they a persons with limited computer skills? 
What I will tell you is that, yes, we have different levels of training. Um, we have, uh, we're working right now with a company called CompTIA. CompTIA is very well known in the employer world, and we actually are, are uh, offering different levels of training. So I am going to encourage uh, you to at least investigate it and, and have a conversation with somebody at the job center, which I can help connect you up with, in order to see if this will work in your case. And I hope that helps, and please do email me. All right, thank you. I know we are quickly running out of time, so uh, we have one last chat box chatter. Stephen? Okay, how can you use this information to help those on your caseload. So if you will um, give a response to that question. All right, and while people are putting comments in the chat box, I'm gonna keep us moving along. Um, we also have one last poll question. So Stephen. Have you found any useful tools or resources in having discussions about employment with individuals, families, during this uh, pandemic, uh, you can yes, no, not sure. Jury still out. So um, we'll see what that comes up with on the, the polling. So um, So um, the responses have come in. Stephen, are you able to see those? Yes, it looks like on yes, there's 13, uh, no, eight, and uh, not sure, uh, 11. So those are the results. All right, so um, just to give you an idea of what we have planned for our future champions of employment, so February 10th, uh, we will be talking about useful tools and resources that support coordinators can be using during this pandemic. March 10th, we're going to be looking to the future, uh, continuing our promising practices beyond the, the pandemic. So looking at what we have found to be great uh, practices that we want to see continue. And then April 14th, uh, we're kind of moving past the pandemic and we're going to start talking about the importance of employment planning. So uh, getting a person's uh, perspective on why is it important to uh, help individuals plan for employment. So last minute reminders, um, we have a survey at the end of this webinar. So please, please take some time to fill out we are going to be using that information to make this event what is going to be useful and beneficial to you guys. We want this to be worth your time. So your feedback is very, very important to us. Uh, and again, we cannot do this without our presenters. So thank each of you for spending time and sharing your unique perspective. Of course, we can't do it without the attendees as well. So thank you guys for spending an hour with us. Uh, and hopefully you have gotten something out of this. So uh, at the top of the hour, there's only two employment first specialists across the state of Missouri, myself and Stephen. I cover the eastern side of the state, so um, Sykeston, Poplar Bluff area, on up through Rolla, St. Louis, Hannibal, and up to Kirksville. 
So that whole eastern side. So you can reach out to me. Uh, my phone number is 636-926-1229. And my email address is sandy.kaiser, and that is spelled K-E-Y-S-E-R, at dmh.mo.gov. And Stephen, I'll let you talk about your area. All right. First of all, I also want to thank the panelists uh, who participated and the attendants. I appreciate it very much. Uh, so I, I serve uh, the Kansas City Regional Office, Albany uh, Satellite Office, Central Missouri Regional Office, Springfield uh, Regional Office, and Joplin Satellite Office. And so my telephone number is 816-889-6920. And my email address is Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, dot Taylor, at D-M-H, dot Mo, dot Gov. And I also want to say um, it's good to see Yvonne again. I haven't seen her in a while. All right. And that concludes our webinar. So thank you all for joining us this morning. You guys have a wonderful week and a great month, and we'll see you in February. Thanks. Bye.